Shalom, everybody, and welcome to the Ishai Fleischer Show, broadcasting live from Jerusalem to the world. You're a part of it wherever you are, and Shalom, and welcome to the Pardes Institute, where we're meeting with Rabbi Mike Foyer. Rabbi Mike, Shalom. Oh, Shalom, Ishai. It's good to see you. It's great to see you, and it's also great to be seen by you, Lirot Lahiraot, here in Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim, Kodesh. And it is a super hot time out there in Israel. It is just, it's just Things heated up. Things are swirling. Up. I mean, we're talking about a, we're talking about a situation in which, let's just like kind of enumerate them. We're talking about, first thing, the Prime Minister of Israel coming out with a type of bombshell announcement, but other people see it as just a political announcement, which is not a bombshell at all. But in any case, he's saying the words sovereignty over the uh, uh, settlements, the Jewish neighborhoods in Judea and Samaria, starting with the already uh, uh, consensus um, Jordan Valley yep. and, and the annexation of it or the sovereignty of Israel over it. There's some difference between those words. Yeah. Um, but in any case, he says that moments later, he's at another political rally. Rockets are starting to come out of Gaza. Right. Hamas is clearly voting for BB or right. against. It's hard to know, actually, to interpret that vote. Right. Well, the way I guess, though, the way they were planning it and you have to be really media savvy. Which is really part of the warfare today. And, yes. and in the trenches out there, it's like, okay, when can the news media report this? Is this too late for the nightly news? It's like... Oh, it was precision. It was right. a precision act. Right. It was precision this wasn't a couple of yahoos who let one rip. Right. Exactly. They, they aimed it at where the prime minister was doing his thing, speaking. By the way, just an interesting aside. My beloved wife and I were watching the prime minister's announcements on the regular Israeli channels. Uh-huh. Well, they were talking over him. Of course they were. They're Israeli. They were talking over <laughs> him. The news analysis was giving analysis as he's speaking. And my wife was flustered and I was annoyed. And it was just like, hey, we're listening to, we want to hear what he says in Au Naturel. And then we'll. No we'll, respect. No respect. Well, what do you do in that moment? Well, where do you get your feed? Where do you get, where do you get away from I, him? I'll rely on you for that information. Okay. So here, here we are. We're like, this is a real modern moment. We're in our kitchen. We're watching on the computer, because we don't have a TV, we're watching on the computer the Netanyahu announcement on the regular TV through the internet. They're talking over him, what do you do? I said to her, pause this, whipped out my cell phone, went to at Netanyahu on Twitter. For sure they were broadcasting just him. Right, hit the live stream button on his feed, and there he was, without being talked over, right? (laughs) And and I knew it too, I'm like, this is the way to do it. You know, so, so we're living in a very modern where you get the broadcast from the dude himself. Moreover, by the way, I had a realization that the prime minister's office in Israel is partially a roadie show, like a road <laughs> show with a full road. When they I say crew, this, yeah, for sure. there's a full on crew that takes things. I asked them, I said to the crew who was recently covered, and I'm like, when is your next gig? They're like, our gigs are every other day. We, we're going to take down the stuff now. We're going tomorrow morning to set up, and the next morning or the next day, he's coming in for the show. What is the show? Well, that's a whole other staff of, right. of content, content, and, and political and, advisors. And right? They're like we just do the framing. Right. We do, we do, right. And what is that framing? It's at least three tents. Okay, I'm not going to go into it, but it's a whole security thing and a whole apparatus and and a stage and a setup and the mics, the whole thing. Cold and, water. And and of course the media stage. Oh behind. yeah, it's a it's a show. Yes, it's a show. It's yes. and I don't mean that in any derogatory sense. I mean that in the show it's business a, sense of show. Yeah, I mean listen, you know? this this is the reality of I mean governance in general, but democracy in particular. So long as the average person has even the slightest influence on who gets to play the role of star in the political drama, then it will be a show. Yeah. I was, I could have guessed that if you would have asked me, but I was just amazed just at the reality it, of it. You know, I'm just like on, this yeah. is this is like a, this is like a show rolled into your town. Recently. It rolled into my town, and it and it did also a lot of damage, by the way, in its in its I, physical wake. I bet because they're not gentle. They're not gentle. They just and crush they, whatever's in their way. Huh? It's crazy. So like, we, oh, we, you can squeeze that in there. <laughs> They just drill and do all kinds of stuff and tons of damage, grass and all kinds of stuff. It was uh, like, yeah. Ground gets sunk Send us in. the bill. Huh? Something like that. It was, it was, it's, really, it's really a wild business. Yeah. In any case, uh, uh, so, it's so- good to be the king. It's tough to be the king. Yeah, I know. It's, it's definitely. A, it's not a, it's an endangered servitude and not exactly just a privilege. Well, it's you a, know, it's funny you say that because I'm at the risk of, 
outing myself as a consumer of popular culture. Have you ever seen Iron Man 2 by any chance? Did you watch any of the Marvel comic movies? You know, it happens to be that you and I had a talk about Marvel comics, and then it right. happens to be that during after that I hung out with you, when we talked about that, then I did indeed go back into that world. And indulge a bit. Of- I, 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 I indulged in it a little bit, and I actually found that the Iron Man series which much was much better than the other stuff. Yeah, it's kind of one of the cores. My reason I raise it is because in Iron Man 2, the, 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 uh, the villain says to Iron Man... Who th- Iron Man thinks he's defeated him. He says, no, because I made God bleed, meaning he brought Iron right. Man down a peg, and he said, now the world will tear him apart. Right. And that and that's exactly what we see. So long as the, the king is this inviolate sort of shining knight in armor, you don't have to take him down. All you have to do is make him bleed. And as mm-hmm. soon as he looks human, then, then the envy and the, the smallness of all the people around him emerges, and yeah, it, uh, a lot of the knives come out. Yes, but for a person like me, when I see that, I basically think about those other people, how little you are, how petty tyrant you are. Oh, for sure. How small you are. And this is one of the great challenges, again, of democracy, is that um, it is so easy to gain power by playing to the lowest common denominator. Yeah. But not with me. Well, not say, with you personally. Like, but no, because unfortunately, I, not everybody's like you. I, I get turned off from it. I'm just like, you are so small. Yeah. Even when they were cutting him off, I'm like, you want to hear your voice so much. That we can't even clearly hear an articulation of a new policy potentially. Just zip it for a second, okay? <laughs> you know, and, and, and you know, I turned them off. Yeah. Um, okay, so there's that. There's Iran. There's Hamas Hezbollah. Yeah, the drone wars, huh? There's the drone wars. Not, but not only that. All in, our, in, our, uh, in our ally, the United States, things are not, not everything is common, Camelot, okay? Oh, sure not. Right, so you have this, this president, whatever you think of him. Uh, and I'm talking about this totally neutrally. He is, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a non-stable element, like a... Uh, Looney? No, no, no. That's, <laughs> I'm not saying that. I, I did not say that. I know you weren't. I was I, just taking advantage of the moment. I don't, I don't think moment. he's Looney at just all. Just taking advantage of the moment. I, I'm, um, uh, uh, something that, that can explode, a, an element he's volatile. that... volatile. He's, he's a volatile. That's, that's Le Coule Alma. Nobody he, disagrees with that. Nope. He wouldn't disagree with and that. And he shoots from the hip. He's volatile. That's, that's what volatile means. You don't exactly know, and I'm not sure he exactly knows, but in any case... Um, uh, our ally of people on the right, John Bolton, uh, gone. He's gone, one way or another. Uh, Greenblatt, who we've come to respect, uh, is also out. Out. Uh, from my sources, I understand that it's really a financial thing in part because of guess what? Yeshiva tuition. Oh uh, okay. no, really? Oh, the reality of the, American Jewry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm 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 happy to help out in this global world crisis issue, but I can't get my kids to yeshiva. Um, so 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 there's that, uh, and then there's there's actual elections coming right up in the country. My friends, our our mutual friend Shmuel Goldman, called me to to discuss the the voting options. And yeah. People do call, you know, to so, talk it out. So what did you what did you push? Well, I I I I I, I, I pushed the right, meaning to say I gave the pluses and minuses for the three right wing parties. That are which the third the the Otsma, which is now ah, which right, is yeah. now they're seemingly looking they're actually going to cross the threshold cross the threshold so that so I spoke about them you know reasonably and, and there there are three parties and there's there's pluses and minuses and I'm sure our, our listeners could, uh, could could discuss all three anyway with it, and, and then there's the and then there's Rosh, now there's if you're tuned into the spiritual clock there's Rosh Hashanah is coming oh yes El is he, taken away here. it's taken away. And you feel it. Oh, yeah. And you know, you know you're going to be standing in front of God. Well, my anniversary is you at Elul. Mm-hmm. And so it's always a good marker of like, wait, wait, we're one third done. <laughs> like, what just right. happened? More right. than one third. Right. We're like, you can look at the moon and she's she, a beautiful moon yeah. last night. And like, looking at the moon in Elul is always a little intimidating. Right. It's intimidating. And it's like, if you're we're serious about full. it, yeah. if you're serious about it, and if that's part of your thing, if that's part of your understanding of what Israel is and the political realities and all that, and you can somehow, that's what I mean by the smallness. If you could step out of their little, little arguments and little constant jabs, and if you could step back up and remember God's big dream and the coming home of the Jewish people to the land of Israel, the creation of a, of, 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 of a Jewish state, which is supposed to be a light unto the nations, et cetera. The, the whole, third kingdom. Right, the whole, the whole thing, and you remember that for a second. Mm-hmm. Um and then and then it clicks into like what what are we doing on the personal level or a national level even on, on chuva one hopes yeah and and it's the image you gave I think is so important is that Elul is a time and it's a strange movement to do two things first of all you got to get down into the nitty gritty 
you got to look at your life with a fine tooth comb and 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 fine tooth comb. Sorry, and and say like, where am I at? And where right. is it working? Where is it not? At the right. same time, the only way to do that without just drowning is to also pop up into the greatness of the horizon, which is way above that. Right. And, and say, like, what a gift, what a gift that this is the way God created the world that we have this time. And what an even greater gift that God told us mm-hmm. about it, that that our calendar is built on a spiritual rhythm, which reflects the topography of creation. It's not simply a, a way of marking time. Right. And you got to hold both those if you want to take advantage, because if you only have the fine tooth comb, yep. most of us can't face ourselves that deeply. But if you only have the big picture, you'll never make any change in your life. And that's what really matters. Right. Such an important combo. Right. And and I would say what you just said slightly differently, which is like, if I'm so concerned about voting on the 17th of September, then then I have another vote, you know, which is the thumbs up, thumbs down of God for me personally, us personally, and also as our nation. And I'm just like, okay, we have something, something bigger here. I, another parenthesis is that the folks at Shas, the mm-hmm. Sephardic party, uh, the Sephardi Haredi party has once again, they're the best with the slogans. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, I hear in your, on your podcast, the Jewish story, you know, talking about sometimes, you know, separation of church and state or, uh, as an issue. I mean, these guys are like, there is no separation between church and state vote for us is the right vote for Yom Hadin for the day of judgment. Yeah, ten tshuva bakalpi. Right, ten tshuva, do, do uh, <laughs> repentance. Well, it's got two meanings. Right. Put an answer, answer? into the ballot box right. and repent right. by putting that answer into right. the ballot box. It's right. brilliant. Or, they, or they, have, they have another slogan which is related, which is uh, a petak shalchala Yom Hadin. Yes, that one your, I saw too. Your, your, uh, your vote. Your slip. Your, your slip. Your, but it also in, in Jewish tradition, it's the it's the... Pitka, the pitka, pitka, the top there, your, your, I can't even think of the word in English, your judgment, basically. Right. And they, they just mix those things. And then they have, a, even they have a Sephardic song, you know, I think it's El Nora Alila, El yeah. Nora Alila. And they, and they play that. There was a video. And it's like, it's like this people doing tshuva and they're also voting for Shaz. <laughs> it's part of the process. You, you, you know, in a sense, as coming from the. But it's Arab- illegal now to give out water that has been blessed by Kabbalists. Okay. But I just remember that. Okay. Uh, Think in, of that. They the, had to pass a law against that in, in, the, in the Muslim Arab tradition, the concept of separation of church and state of Rome and God, Caesar and God, mm-hmm. is is not it's not present. Also, I mean, also in our root tradition, right? But we've been deeply Westernized in that yeah. respect, and I think there are benefits to it. You know, you know, I was talking to somebody. I was talking with Jeremy Sultan, who said to me last week we talked about. The priests, the prophets, the king, uh, priest, prophet, king, and the courts, and, and the courts, and the cops, courts and the, the cops. Are the same. Here. He's like, but there's another group that you missed. What's that? The elders. How are they different than the courts? I don't know. I don't. I don't think they're a court. I think they're the folks that. I, mean, I don't think they're just a court. They're the folks who come out at the end of the town. They're the town leadership. They're the wise men. They're the. I mean, I don't. I don't, okay. think, it's, I don't think it's the same as a court. I don't it is in the rabbinic mind. When they said right, but an elders is also like a like a like a council of elders, a council, which is which is not just a court. A court comes to decide, has to have a case in controversy. Okay, but I think that that's again a, a, um, a bit of a misapplication of political theory. The 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 Torah's notion of a court is a quasi legislative institution. Right. It's not just jurisdiction. Right, right, right. Always has been. Okay, but okay, I get the okay, point. Okay, but you know, no, even 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 what you said now, that's fine. Even that's clarifies it for us. That there is not only the court as in a adjudicating somebody right. else's laws. Right, these guys are coming out and they're they're making policy for the town or they're for the place. actually leading. Right. Anyway, okay, so there's a lot of stuff. So so the maelstrom is is spinning again, and, and the kids are back in school. The, hey, right, the kids are back to school. How many parent meetings have you gone to this week? I have not gone to one, but my <laughs> wife has, and I've stayed home watching the kids. But. Uh, what I sometimes call babysitting, what my wife calls parenting. Okay, it's a, mm, it's a little joke that we had there. <laughs> we have in our house, um, and uh, and there there is um, there was one there is one more thing, which is spinning the whole thing. What's like the kids are back to school, it's winter is coming, war is like oh, like like constantly mini looming elections. I find the fact that the continental plate is splitting in the Jordan Valley <laughs> to be quite disturbing <laughs> on a certain scale, but we can leave that out of it. <laughs> Anyway, the point is, is that is that the situation is is definitely uh, volatile, but also awesome. Well, I mean, 
I, I wouldn't want to live in boring times. Right. It's just there's an awesomeness. There's an awesomeness to it all. If oh, yeah. you can, if you can get above the fray. You have to. That's what I meant. Is yeah. you have to be in the fray for it to matter. Right. But you have to have be above the fray to actually maintain some sense of 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 hopefulness and um, and sanctity and sanity and sanity. And and I, I personally, I, and I think that for listeners of the show, the the great island of sanity and truth in a world of uh, of uh, a postmodern world of, of, of that many truths, constructs. right? Like there's a beauty and an island of sanity and, and, and clarity in the Torah yes. and having the Torah and the Torah portion of the week is an awesome, awesome anchor of sanity. It's packed with so much. Right. And this Torah portion has the most amount of commandments in the whole Torah. There's basically three Torah portions, which are, which are, uh, which are, uh, Mishpatim, Mishpatim. Shoftim also uh-huh. that we just had Kitetza and I think also uh, what do you call it Achrei uh, Mokdoshim. Uh, yes, these, these, this huge, is yeah. this are these are the basics of the where the Talmud comes into play. So we have a very long Torah portion with many sections, as in uh, our custom for the last few weeks. We shall only um, talk about a few uh, topics that I, that Such I picked out. Such is our custom. Such is our custom, and the first one is you go to war. Okay, so we're in the book of Deuteronomy, book of Devarim. This is now the speech, the part of the speech of Moses, which is called the Neuma Mitzvot, the commandment speech. Okay, it's shifted from narrative and storytelling to... It's like that moment in Shul where you see everybody start to nod off. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> when the rabbi gets into the gritty... gritty. That's right, that's right. <laughs> and so we have a lot of law, and we're in chapter 21, verse 10, and the Torah portion is going to speak about something possibly unpleasant, I'm sure, to some of your students here at parties, hard to swallow, which is the... Uh, woman of beautiful appearance, which you see during a time of war. The war wife. The war, the war wife, the war woman, and you and you either cohabit with her right there and then, the soldier, or takes her back home, right? And and and, and the law says she's got to either cut her nails or 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 un, don't not cut her nails, but in any case, she's got to kind of take off her. She's got to wear these clothes of. Uh, she's not attractive any longer. She's she's yeah. In some way, she's not clothes in the, of mourning, and and, and she's got to cry for her parents. Right. She's now velet. She like literally uh, uh, just doesn't look so good. Right. She doesn't look so good. She's not. It's not. It's not the heat of war in that kind of moment. And the Torah says, okay, but here's here's how to here's how you have to deal with this woman, and it kind of gives you a type of out to do this act, which is. Uh, ostensibly not very not morally very morally reprehensible right very ch- very morally challenging at least so I, I gotta tell you i witnessed uh, an, one of my colleagues giving a class on this yeah. the other day and i have to say i was deeply disappointed with the apologetics mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i mean because well, you already noted that even amongst the classical commentators it's not clear when it says like, or you go out to war against your enemies and and you win and you see this this beautiful woman and you take her it's not clear if that means you take her captive and you have to wait a month and marry her properly or actually no as unfortunately still happens in war that there's an immediate sort of sexual interaction that happens there um and he he denied strenuously the the second one and said it was the first except the reality is the rambam says very clear Mm -hmm. that both are part of this process and and what's to me unfortunate i mean i understand why he did it because you are correct that for my students this is fairly hard to swallow. Not that it happens. It's hard to swallow that the Torah would institutionalize it in their eyes. Right. But it's a deep misunderstanding. But, but the sages themselves admit or, or discuss that this is a tough thing. But not only that, but, the, but Raji brings what to me is the most important insight. right? Because and before I get to what it is, we have to remember that the Torah, like all um, sort of elements of revelation, has a dilemma, so to speak. Right. Revelation That's is what like I meant. definition... Parochial, meaning it happened to specific people at a specific time in a specific place. Otherwise, it's not real, right? Sinai is a real place. The people who came out of Egypt were real people, which means they spoke a language, they had a cultural context, meaning for the infinite will to be understood, it had to come in a very specific form. Mm -hmm. But God's will was forever, Mm -hmm. which means it's as relevant to you and I here at the latter part of the sixth millennia or or 21st century, whenever you think you are, right? As it was 3,000 plus years ago. So how does that work? And this actually is one of the great revelations of how it works. Because in the world 3,300 years ago, the idea that you couldn't just take a woman in battle, do your will with her, and then sell her into slavery was a huge moral leap forward. 
The fact that the Torah says you cannot sell her into slavery at the end of it, you've now done her wrong, so to speak, and you are responsible for a proper marriage, which in the ancient world meant you are financially responsible. Just, just, just in parentheses, like, people rape, then kill. Yes. Or then victims. kill, right, or, or then sell into slavery, right. which is more profitable. Right. You know? But my point is, is that the, the, the Torah takes this moral stand, and even there, the sages are bothered, like you point out, it's like, we have a higher expectation of behavior. So Rashi brings their deepest insight. Says lo daber Torah ela keneged hara. The Torah is only speaking against the evil inclination in man. So my students will still protest to me. It's like, what, what do you mean? The Torah is like just saying, okay, well, let him do it because he can't help himself. I say no. What I've said to them before is that is that the Torah is trying to train us away from that. You can't just flip a switch and change a human being right. or human culture. Right. And I actually had a, quite a fierce discussion with a student on this once, and finally at the end I said to her, I just want you to know that your deep opposition to this is the greatest victory that the Torah could have. Because it created a culture that would bring about someone like you who is so uh, not only offended personally, but morally opposed to this act, that you will deny the Torah itself in order to defend the ultimate value that it's communicating. You know, and that's the brilliance of the divine will within right. the Torah. Right. And it's, it causes a cultural evolution, mm -hmm. which is why I think it's important not to shy away from the shot, from the simple meaning of what's happening here. Very good. Very good. Uh, although one commentator who did shy away from the meaning or didn't shy, but took it to a totally different place. I mentioned every year. I'll mention it again, which is the Orachayim. And he says something completely fascinating, different. He says, listen, a Jewish soldier is super holy. And he comes into a place of war and he's slaying the bad guys and he's taking what's ours and he's pushing back the, the people who want to destroy us, etc. And he walks into a house and he sees a woman. He sees in her a Jewish soul. He sees in her that she's somehow captive of the Yetzir Hara. And he's like, I'm going to go through a process of bringing you into our nation because I see something in you. And if you think about that, that also is a cultural war. I mean, say we have a lot of culture that we have to fight against. We have to slash and burn it. We have to keep bring up, put up walls or I don't know what to, to push it away. But sometimes there's a thing. Yes. And that thing has to be brought in. And even that thing needs to go through a process yes. uh, of, of, uh, of koshering, if you will. Yeah, this is what Rav Cook calls Gyur Haraya Not. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a conversion of ideas. It's very interesting. I wonder if he's, his, his thought is rooted in the Orchaim. I have to try to trace that That's down. That's an interesting thought. Um, okay. And for the sake of time, we have to go on because we really do have a lot. Uh, so we dealt now with the, the Shah Yafat Tor. And let me see where my next note is. Okay, here we go. Uh, okay. Now I jumped all the way to verse uh, chapter 21, verse 22, which is uh, about a person who commits some kind of capital offense and then gets hung up on a tree, gets hanged. Uh, it's important to know that, that in Jewish law, we're not talking about hanging like by, by the, the neck. neck. We're talking about killing uh, a person and then displaying him on a tree. Right. Now, what the law is not what the what the uh, custom was was to do it right at the end of the day, put him up on the tree for a minute or two, for a little bit for a short period of time, and then take him down. Because what the Torah says, you're not allowed to leave him hanging there. You're not allowed to leave him on the tree. You have to take it down and bury him properly. Right. It's a curse to God when someone is hung up like that. Right. You know, and, and, and it goes to the heart of the tension, again, that the Torah is holding. On one hand, this person did something worthy of death. Right. So, like, hey, let's, let's, let's not only stone him, let's drag his body through the streets, I don't know, behind a motorcycle or something. Right, like, um, the, but on the other hand, this Rashi once again brings the Midrash, what does it mean, kilalat elim talui? It's a curse to God that he's hung. Well, because it's like two twins that are born. One becomes the king and the other one becomes a bandit. When the bandit gets caught and hung... Everybody looks at him saying, hey, look, they hung the king. So the king obviously is God. And humanity created in the image of God, meaning don't forget, every time we do something wrong, it's actually two things wrong. It's whatever we've done, and it's a disgrace to the divine. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really, so we minimize that disgrace by saying, yeah, he did it. Don't right. forget. We got we to gotta show the punishment, but then we still have to honor the, hu the divine within this human being. Right, that's right. Right? And, and, it, and it is all but impossible. It is possible, unfortunately, I think, but all but impossible to destroy the Tzalem Halloween within a, within a human being, destroy the divine image. Mm -hmm. I unfortunately do have a suspicion that it's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, a little, a little uh, humorous, but, uh, but um, homiletic here, which is... Ki That's your next book, humorous right. but homiletic. Yeah. Ki kilalat elo, elo, elokim talui, 
Tului means uh, it could be like this, it could be like this in modern Hebrew, right? It means depends. Depends, Which right? is the same in English. Something right. could be one way or the other or hanging. Right. right. Well, sometimes living on the edge and being like, well, it could be like this, it could be like this, it could be like this, it could be like this. When you don't have clarity, that's a curse. Oh, for sure. And that's why we say, uh, ain't simcha el hataratz fekot. Yes. Okay. So here, the opposite of that is kilat elokim talui. Right, it's right. a curse to be hung. To be, to be, two, to two be options. like always, like well, 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 well. You know, it's you, you got to come down. You got to come on down. The on the other hand, right? On the other hand, and you learn that in law school, and sometimes you actually start to be able to really be good at arguing the other side, but you forget what truth is because you're so good at seeing both sides. Or listen, at the risk of sides. generalizing all Jewish history, that's one of the problems of the overdevelopment of the rabbinic mind. It's one of the reasons right. that the Zionists were so enamored of the Tanakh right. and not so fond of rabbinic culture. Right. That's right. Um, yeah, uh, sometimes you just got to come down and, and be decisive. A lot of times people say to me, well, 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 well don't the Palestinians, uh, can't they argue the same thing? I go, I don't know. I'm not their advocate. <laughs> I just say to people, like, I remind people, I'm like, I'm like, let me, uh, maybe you don't know my role. I'm the advocate for my people. Right. And something that it's a, it's a Russian thing that my mom said to me that her father said to her, like, you've got to be your own advocate. I'm like, I'm not the advocate for, I'm not, I'm not finding the logical flaw in my thing or the logical similarity to their case. I'm, I'm not there for that. I'm here to be an advocate for my people. And I think that that's a uh, Kim Okay, fine. Uh, let's go to the next one. Ding. Um, yes, I marked for myself here a verse, again, chapter 22, verse 3, which basically says that if you find um, an artifact... The donkey, perhaps the, a lost donkey, and we actually have a case of that in the book of uh, book of Samuel. Uh, the lost donkey, you have to you have to return it. You have to look for the owner. You have to house it, and the Gemara is going to go through many of the laws of how much you're supposed to expend sure. in order to house this. But basically, for his garment and for all the things that are lost for your brother, uh, don't look away. Lo tucha lehit alim. That's the key. Right. Don't You can't look away. And we all know, by the way, that sometimes we look away. And Rashi says here uh, that, that look away means, uh, where is it? Lichbosh la'alim enecha ki'ilu encha ro'eoto. Like, look away and make it look like I didn't see oh, it. Oh, sorry. I would have, but I didn't, I didn't. notice. But you know, you know, you walk past somebody who's asking for money. For sure. And you just act like you didn't see them. You don't necessarily give them an excuse. Yep. You Listen, just... Make yourself as though you didn't see it. I, Don't do that. I think that this this area of law, which is called Hashafat Veda, the returning of lost objects, um, is actually one of the most um, profound sort of, we'll call it social organizing principles in the entire Torah. Because if you could succeed, and sadly we have not, if you could succeed in instilling this in the same way in religious Jewry as we've instilled the laws of Kashrut, laws of Shabbat, etc., that you, you have now... Don't misunderstand me. This it has a deep expression. I mean, it, one of the characteristics of religious neighborhoods is you walk around, you see little signs up, you know, found lost keys, found, you know, this. I'm not saying that it's not done, but my point is, is that there's a much deeper engagement. For instance, if you look in the extent of these laws, if I walk by someone's house and I see that um, I don't know a faucet on the outside of their house is is on and the water's gushing out, it's my Torah level responsibility to turn that off, as long as I don't assume it was intentional. Why? Even if there's no damage is done, I have to preempt the damage being done. I mean, there's right. a level of mutual responsibility. Right. Right? And, and the flip side is what Rashi said, is that it, it, it fights against one of the deepest elements of social psychology, which is to draw very tight boundaries of responsibility. And, and the way we do that is by convincing ourselves that we just don't see. Another one of a field that maybe is a derivative of this is the derivative of uh, Kinyan Ruchani, they call it in Hebrew, uh, which is um, uh, uh, intellectual property. Mm -hmm. Intellectual property gets lost all the time. Oh, yeah. People read it. They re re say it. Uh, yep. In media, they will re you know, redo it and, and take, your, take your ideas. And, and I think that intellectual property, not losing other people's intellectual property, again, brings geula to the world. When you say something in somebody's name, it's like I am actually not losing that person's master. This idea, this idea came from something. It was developed as, as something, and you got You give it the credit, and when you when you give it the credit, there's something that happens there, and people respect you so much more when you're a person who can quote somebody else and say, sure. "I spoke to this person. He said this thing." 
you know, my it's my mom or my daughter. It doesn't matter, you know. A lot of times when I'm writing an article, I feel bad. I tell my mom, I'm like, I would love to write you in here. I don't know what to say. Should I say in parentheses, my mom told me? I don't know what to say. <laughs> it's a tricky thing, you yeah. know, what I mean? because, but, but like, I, I, it's very, it's a serious business, I think, intellectual property. It is, although what's interesting is that in the halachic discourse, in the legal discourse, it's actually, there's something called zuto shel yam in these laws, which is that if, if I lose something in somewhere where it's just gone, by definition, it gets swept away, so then I have no ownership of it, even if I find it again and it's one of the sources of the whole discourse around intellectual property if i put something out on the internet there's an argument to be made that when i put it out there i know for a fact it's just gone so that's, on, that's only because we believe that people will not give you credit it doesn't correct. have to be gone because it's actually the most traceable in the world no but my point is is it's just your i think that morally your point is well taken and certainly right. as you said that a person who says something in the name of the person who said it brings redemption to the world but legally halachically it's actually the internet that pushes us toward a notion of a, a lack of ability to exercise property, intellectual property rights. Okay, okay, that's a that's a that's an interesting question, uh, but still we can we can all each take take upon ourselves uh, that effort. For example, if you heard something in the show, you know, say I heard it in the name of. Uh, speaking of, if you heard the show, uh, please uh, rate. Uh, do a little thing and rate your these shows of our network highly on whatever you're listening to. I know that uh, that we try very hard to get it out on Stitcher, iTunes, and all the other you know all the other podcast aggregators out there. So it's very very important. It's a lot of hard work, and it's really done with a lot of love. So give us the love right back if you can. That would be that that would be intellectually awesome if you would just like me. Yeah, like me, uh, and help other people like more. That's that's the way you help today. That's is by true. is by uh, leaving a good review. Uh, let's go to two laws here. And one is uh, about the uh, about the uh, sending away the mother bird, shooing away the mother bird. This is a very famous law. Uh, my my son just came back from Chabad. Uh, like he gets like one day a week, he goes to like Chabad stuff with Rabbi Shloimi in Efrat, and uh, and guess what? He came back with a little picture of a bird, kind of being sent away with real feathers and stuff, neat stuff. And uh, and the basic law is very simple. If you're going to be if you're going to walk on the path or you're going to get uh, some eggs or some chicks for yourself, you have to shoo away the mother bird before you take those things. Now, there's a few different ways of reading it. Either it's for psychological health for this mother that she doesn't see the, uh, uh, the, her chicks being taken away. Another read is actually completely different. It has nothing to do with the psychological health. It's meaning to say, do not take the mother bird along with these things, with the, with the eggs or the chicks, meaning to say, allow for another generation to flourish. The sustainability perspective. Su sustainability, right? Like, like the whole point is not that she doesn't see. That's not the issue. Do not take her with. Right. Okay. And that's what my mom says. My mom says that the... Uh, uh, that, that here, when it says that you'll have long days from doing this mitzvah, that you'll be blessed with that you will be good for you and you shall have long days she's like it's because of uh, uh, sustainability what's the it's word an, an intergenerational perspective Re reusable energy it's yes, a renewable re resource re renewable resource there uh, so that's that's two what do you have to add about that uh, I mean, if you wanted to go for a third instead of going back to those, is I think there's also, and this one comes up in, both in an argument between the Rambam and the Ramban, um, there's a psycho-emotional effect on me. That, that, that Forget the bird and how she feels about taking the eggs. I associate that bird with motherhood. Right. And so therefore the act of cruelty of saying, I'm going to take for me what I want, and you do, right? It, it doesn't train me toward a sensitivity to the world. Right. And that's, a, that's a third piece, although it's, it's, an, it's an edgy one because not everybody likes that. I think that people understand that naturally. I know, but this uh, is an yeah. argument of the Rambam and the Rambam. The yeah, no, I, I think, <laughs> I, think I, I can understand that. Okay, he, here, though, I must tell you that within this verse lies uh, one, of, um, one of the great uh, joys that I've ever had in my life in terms of Torah learning. Really? And yes, it lies re really within this very verse. And what happened was, is like this. When I was in Ali, I think I told you this last year. When I was in Aliyah activism, still am in Aliyah activism, but when I was really, really active in, in Aliyah, Propagation. When you were a young whippersnapper. You're right. So I was like, this verse explains how to work in this field. Because what it says is the parents I got it. <laughs> are holding the kids back. 
you have to shoo away the parents and, and steal their children and take the children <laughs> towards your side. Of course, by the way, the Heshiv Lev Avot Al Banim, like in right, the ultimately, end, the parents will follow. Because the grandkids. <laughs> doesn't mean, it just means shoo away the mother bird and yeah. show the kids because the mother bird in America is like, you can't go to Israel. It's dangerous. I don't want to leave you. Blah, 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 blah. You have to sometimes somehow detach that and bring in uh, this next generation. But what happened was is that when I thought this thought, I thought to myself, boy, that's kind of blasphemous or, you know, that is not the meaning of the verse. And if I teach that to people, I'll get in a lot of trouble. So I have to keep my mouth shut on it. What happened was subsequently is that I found this explained in the Bala term and I should have brought the original text. The word teshalach is also the word teshalach here. It's not in the Bala term here. It's in the other uh, matching word, which is in, um, which is in the song of the sea. Mm -hmm. Teshalach ruchcha yivron, right? Like, uh, like, like you'll send, you'll send, you'll send your wind. In any case, so, so it says there. What, what did God do? He wanted to bring his children into the land of Israel, but the generation of the ex Exodus was holding them back. So he had them die in the desert, so he can bring in his. And that's what, it, and the Balaturim says exactly like this verse about the mother bird. He shooed away the mother bird and brought his children into the land of Israel. And then it's not you, it's the Balaturim. But do you understand that the meaning of the verse was exactly the same? It wasn't even, it wasn't even like, it, it wasn't a tight. It, yeah. was, it, was, it was exactly on, which is on, on the issue of Aliyah, mm -hmm. which is that the parents were holding it back yep. and he had to bring in the next generation. So I was like, wow, that was a, that was a joyous moment in my life. Listen, this is a profound challenge we face, even for those of us that are here. There's still a certain mentality which is holding us back from acting as right. a people in our land. Right. You, you know, you said it exactly, which is the, 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 the misread of what I said is don't listen to parents and, and take the young people. Like in the 60s, don't right. listen to anybody over 30. That right. is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is there are things that hold us back. We all have our own mother bird. Mm -hmm. We all have our own mother bird that we have to shoo away yeah. In order to reach our potential. Yes, absolutely. We have to shoo something that's holding us back a fear. And and not always just fear. Sometimes it's just simply an incorrect understanding of the situation which came to us from the past. One of the great rules of history is yesterday's solutions are tomorrow's problems. Right? And if we get overly wedded to the particular solution as opposed to our ability to engage the situation as it is and come up with some sort of answer, then oftentimes we get stuck. I mean, the very thing that saved us can be that which drags us down. Mm -hmm. It's one of the great challenges. How, how do you spell shoo away? How is that spelled? Is that S-H-O-O? -O? What is that? I don't have to look it up. Uh, that's a Malka question. Uh, maybe the show's name should be shoo away fear. Shoo away the fear. Shoo away the fear. All right, maybe. Okay. Yeah, but we definitely want to spell it correctly. Then we definitely will. Not like shoo, like like a shoe. Okay. Uh, we have a shoe in this week's tour portion. I don't think we're going to get to that one, which is the, <laughs> the leverett marriage and, and the taking of the yeah. That but, was an insider joke. Anyway. Yes, that's right. Shoo away, right? Okay. Okay. Uh, the other one, actually, the next verse that I wanted to discuss is right next to it, which is about the roof. You you build a house. You've got to put a um, uh, uh, what's the? There's a fancy word for it. There's a fancy fence. Par parapet. <laughs> oh, parapet. Is well, that parapet the is more of like you know it has to do with certain fortifications. Or okay. On top of a castle, okay. You got to put a fence. fence. Call it a fence. You got to put a fence. Around now, the houses were and continue to be here in the Middle East with flat roofs. The Talmud talks a lot about uh, a sukkah on the roof. Yep. Okay, we're not talking about like a fiddler on the roof here. We're talking about sukkah on the roof. We're talking about a flat roof. Yeah, because around here, fiddler on the roof makes perfect sense. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, meaning the whole point of that Tevye story is that to be a Jew in Europe was like being a fiddler on a roof. Right. You can't really, you're going to wear a move, you're going to fall off. Right. But actually it makes sense to be a fiddler on a roof in the Middle East because it's flat. It's a perfect That's place right. for It's a much better to be a fiddler you're on a roof. Here. There you and go. There's, there's a deep uh, message there. The thing I wanted to stop on on this verse was that it says uh, you have to put away, you have to put this fence around the, the roof because the faller shall fall from it. Yeah. The faller shall fall from it. Meaning to say, on the simple level, it means a person could fall. Right. The guy who's going to fall will fall. He'll fall. If you're not careful, they'll be falling. Right. It's not really not so tricky. No, it's, although, it's, it's, I mean, it is a strange uh, syntax. The syntax is strange, and that's why Rashi says, this guy was supposed to fall. He deserved to fall <laughs> for well, one reason or another. I mean, elsewhere, the implication is, we, we see in a discussion elsewhere, um, that he might have been someone who should have been punished by death for murder, right. but there were no witnesses to do so properly. So he's basically got a spiritual debt, which is God is collecting, 
Right. You know, by causing him to fall. But right. what your, your point but doesn't have, the other it doesn't half. have to be on my roof. Right. It doesn't have to be on my watch. To, right. Not my watch. Not, not over my, not in my, uh, th- through me. Meaning to say, if you, if, and, and the Rashi says this very, very famous uh, uh, phrase, which is, uh, it says, Megalgalin schut al yedei zakai vechova al yedei chayav. A person who's got merits, m- meritorious things happen to him. What happens person, through him? Through him. Oh, you day. Through him. That's right. And a person who has debts, and that's what chova means, a person right. that, is, that is a debtor, a spiritual debtor, well, the debt's taken through him. And a, it's interesting because one could Be, read that. You, you could just say, here in the Middle East, you could say it's maktub. Yeah. It's written. He was supposed to fall. Ah, that's exactly, exactly what I was going to speak against. He was supposed to fall, and you could read it as a fatalism. Right. Listen, if you have merits, meritorious things come into the world through you. If you've got debts, bad things come into the world through you. But the whole point of this is that you're being called to do a mitzvah, meaning we don't believe in a a fatalistic world in which what I've done in the past dictates what will happen to me in the present because I can always do the mitzvah. What if I am a, a, a chov person, I have debts, and there's some guy who's meant to die who's on my roof, but I did the mitzvah. You know what the answer is? So even though I have debts and he's meant to die, it won't happen through me. Why? Because mm-hmm. the, the power that comes to doing mitzvah is the ability to break the cycle of fatalism. I can always change my destiny through both the belief and the actions that, that the Torah dictates. So it's a, you understand the distinction there? Sure. So it's, it's a very important one in this story. And he also, that if you buy the time, so he goes on your roof, and there's a fence, and he looks down, and everything's fine. He doesn't fall. Maybe, maybe he'll do tshuva. Yeah. Maybe there'll be another way to pay that debt. Maybe he won't have to fall off that roof. It's it's very true. And I want to add just as a you come into my house, it's a holy house. It's got the mitzvot. It's got a, it's maybe he's going to also see my library. Maybe he's going to ask me to put on tefillin. Maybe he's going to come to a just, different place. Just think of it simply. Like the guy's up on the roof. He stumbles. He has his life flashes before his eyes, and suddenly this sort of like chest high fence catches him he's like <gasps> and there he is he's looking at what could have been right and but that's just because i said oh of course there's a fence on my roof that's right. what the torah says to do that's right and by the way lest people think that this is a um just a just a thing in the torah you look around in israel and it is a reality unfortunately not everywhere we actually had the the um the arab man who was the janitor here for many years at pardes died from falling off his roof because where which he, one which one was? Which janitor? The Jan- guy that was here always? Well, I mean, he hasn't oh. been here for a, about a year and a half. He passed away. Um, from this fall? From falling off his roof, which did not have a fence around Give it. Give out. Yeah. I did not know that. I was wondering where he was. There was a different guy here today. And yeah. I was like, where's that other guy? Yeah. So No, no, not the one you're thinking of. Okay. This has been a year and a half since Hussein passed okay. away. Okay. But um, Arabs, Arabs don't. By the way, Arabs have flat roofs. And yeah. often, there is no fence around There's the, certainly the roof. no commandment in their tradition to have one. Right. Okay. Very good. Let's go on. Uh, here's one that, that you probably wouldn't guess that I, that I wanted to stop on. Nothing surprised me. Okay. <laughs> and that is, uh, it says, uh, uh, certain people that have uh, injuries uh, are not part of Kahal Hashem, but the only reason, uh, they're not part of the congregation. And the only reason I'm stopping here is because there's a word called Patsua Daka. What is a Patsua Daka exactly? Uh, it's a moom. It's a, some kind of... Uh, Injury or uh, right, right. sort of genetic imperfection. Involving the testicles. It. Yes. The only reason I'm stopping here is that in the in, in the Chabad Lubavitch day, day reading, they have this like day uh, lessons, there was a discussion about this word daka, which is which the Alter Rebbe saw, I think in the Torah of the Maharami Rutenberg, written with an aleph. And he says, Lahalacha, in his opinion, it should be written with an aleph. And it was in another place as well. And we write it with a hey. And, and that's it. Meaning to say, we have a Torah. It is perfect. It is God's word. And yeah, and, and we have it across. But the, but the Alter Rebbe was like, the first Lubavitch Rebbe was like, I actually believe that this should be an aleph and not a hey. And, and these little, uh, it's like, it's like it's, for some people, that, that change is like, whoa. It, it fundamentally undermines what they mean by perfect. Right. And yet, and yet the Torah is, it's not a science, it's an art, you know? That's an important distinction, and I want to rest with it for one second, because when we say perfect, we mean perfect in God's conception. 
right? Its manifest form is always subject to not only human error, but also human expression. And that's the whole endeavor of the oral tour is. You know, in, in this case, this particular type of injury, and from a technical perspective, can also be caused, caused by a testicular biopsy. Mm -hmm. You know why people would have a testicular biopsy? Right? Sometimes to try to identify the causes of male infertility. Mm -hmm. So Rav Moshe Feinstein, in the mid to late, I think it was later part of the 20th century, she made a judgment that it can't be that this is something which is a cause for someone not to be married. That's what the mm -hmm. Torah says. If the reason they're doing it is in order to have children to fulfill the mitzvah. Mm -hmm. So he said, that the world has changed to the point that if what you're doing is not only not causing a person to be infertile, but is actually a way in which to determine how to make them fertile, that even though technically it's the same thing, ultimately it is not. Mm -hmm. This is another great example that he was able in his wisdom to see what the divine intention was and not change a, a letter or a word in the Torah, mm -hmm. but to change the way in which it plays out in our lives. And 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 I like just as a kind of submission, maybe there's a difference between hay and olive. Meaning to say, maybe in our time we need an olive as opposed to a hay. Yeah. For that for that change to it take could, place. Could be. And I just thought that was really cool. And I saw it. and I was like, wow, you know. And and I think I think people, especially Balei Tshuva, that come into Torah, they have this conception that it's rigid. And, the, and, and Rabbi Tendler once told us such a beautiful thing. He's like, halacha is a box. Within the box, you can move. And then there's outside of the box. That's something different. Sure. But, but there, you've got to have wiggle room. And, and there's wiggle room in Judaism for 12 tribes that walk in 12 paths. Sure. For a shin that either has three uh, kind of uh, uh, lines or four. Or for commandments that are either 613 or at least 612. Okay? <laughs> there's, it, it's... The, the, and, and, and that wiggle room is key. And, the, and it also allows for perspective. It allows for another way of understanding something. I'll tell you, to me, most importantly, what it allows for is life. The halacha is an organic endeavor. It's alive. It's growing. Right. It's not some abstract philosophical pursuit that's trying to nail things down into sort of like a cold perfection. That's not the way, that's not the way we roll as a people. It's not the way we roll. It's not the way we roll. Let's keep going. It's just messy, to, but it's effective. That's right. Let's keep going just because of time interests. Uh, one of my favorite, 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 favorite Torah commandments is you got to have a holy army camp. Now, if you have ever been to an army camp, it's generally not so holy for many reasons. And, and yet it says, guess what? If you're going to have an army camp, I want you to have a special place where you go to the bathroom. Not okay. just a special place, but a special tool with which to do right. it. Right. So it's got two sides. First, it's Yad. Yad is a place. A place should be with for you outside of the camp. And that's where you got to go poopy. You got to go out there. Okay, fine. Not only that, you have to have on your other vessels that you carry with you, on your your stuff, the things they carried, if anybody read that, um, you got to have along that a... Um, trowel. A trowel. A trowel. Uh, which is a little shovel, folks. Okay. And when, and you have to, you, and it says, it says like this, listen, listen carefully, because I've shown this to my kids and it's made a big impact on them. It says, dig, and then you should sit and do your thing, and then you should cover the thing that came out of you. This is very important. I know since you're, you're, you're uh, I, I was just like, the amount of memories I have of right. teaching like well-off suburban kids, how do you actually deal with going to the bathroom in the real world where right. there's not, you know, sort of like plush toilet paper and a, and a heated seat. I mean, I've right. literally dozens and dozens. Right. It's, uh, yeah. But there's nothing more clean and beautiful than when you finish your doing your business and you cover it up and it's more or less the way nature was and it goes back into the earth in a normal way. And there's nothing more foul than going out to nature. Coming across someone's mess. Right, someone's mess with the flying toilet paper and the, and the yeah, mess, and it flies, and you're like, what did you do? Didn't you know that, first thing, didn't you like have plain manners? And then, and then two, didn't, didn't you ever have a mic for her to teach you what to do? Well, the answer is most people don't. Right. Now, what I do in the army with this is I say to them, hey, some guy's like, hey, you guys have toilet paper? You give them toilet paper. I'm like, do you need a shovel, buddy? He's like, what? I'm like, I got a shovel because I was very mockbit to take a shovel to, to take this shovel to the army. And I'm like, it's in the Torah. They're like, no, it's what not. What are you talking about? <laughs> and I would show them this verse and they would always be like, it says this in the Torah? And yeah. I'm like, yes. It's very important. Right. This is what it says in the Torah. And look how clean and simple it is. And specific. Specific. It's process. Right. And, and, and as another mistake could be just to cover it over. No, no you got to dig first. Dig down. Make a hole. Cover it over. Come back to nature as much as possible. Yeah, After yeah. you do your thing. And it's beautiful. And it's clean. And if you didn't do it, it's not as clean. 
I just want to say that it says at the, the verse, verse 15, chapter 23, verse 15, it says, Ki Hashem Okecha mitalech, Hashem your God is walking amongst you, bekerv machanecha, in your, in your camp, let, to protect you, to defend, to save you, and to give your enemies from before you. And therefore, machanecha kadosh, your camp has to be holy. This word mitalech appears only one other time in the Torah, and that is in the Garden of Eden, because the Spirit of God walks in the Garden of Eden. So you got the Garden of Eden, and then you have this army camp. They are, on, 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 one, uh, on one, on first analysis, first blush. It's as far apart as you get. Right. No, God is with you. He's walking with you in your camp. In this world, you're at war. Next world, you'll visit the Garden of, e of Eden. Here, we're at war, and that's where God is with you. And that's, in, in this place, is where I want you to stay holy. Yeah. And, I, and I do wish a lot of times that our Israeli army would have more of that consciousness. Yes. I, I, I really do. I mean, that's what moral army is to me. Not being nice to the bad guys, but, but, but pooping in the right place. Well, you know? understanding and, and that... They, keeping our mouths pure in the army, which is a big problem. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that it, the bottom line notion is understanding that our physical actions are the beginning of holiness. And holiness isn't some abstraction of, of ideas or rituals. And this is why it begins with what is really the most physical of actions. Right. And God is there with you. Oh, he's, sure. he's walking with you. There's nowhere where God isn't. Right. But, Except but, for the places where you drive God right. out. Let, or, in, in, interesting, you have to know that there is a place where we don't put a mezuzah, which is the bathroom, right? That's different. I mean, that, meaning that's because of the sanctity that we place in our experience of the, of the cloth, of the mezuzah itself. But you know, it's actually a debate amongst the, the Hasidim and the Mitnagdim because Hasidim were very big on late Ata Panui Mina. And like, there's nowhere which is clear. And their answer was always, the Mitnagdim was always, well, what about the bathroom? Right. No, so the bathroom is that, that you don't, uh, God's in the bathroom, but, 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 but you honor him when you come out. I mean, so you made the blessing about it. And you're very silent and distancing, distance, distancing your thoughts right. from God is what gives God presence That's even right. though those blessings. a great Reb Zushan, Reb Elish, uh, Reb Elish story about that. Of but course. We'll save it for another time. That's right. Famous story. Uh, speaking of, of keeping your mouth uh, clean also, Motza, uh, this is verse 24, Motza Sfatecha Tishmor. Watch what you say. Watch what comes out of your mouth. Yeah, well, not just watch what comes out of your mouth, meaning also keep your word. Keep your I mean, word. The context there right. is making vows. You should make sure if you're going to let something out of your mouth, then you need to do it. The Torah discourages right. making vows because right. it, it's creating a potential stumbling block. But if you're going to promise, it's a do or die situation. And I want to say for people, and I say this sometimes to people when I see that they're loose about this, try to know what you're talking about. If you don't know what you're talking about, don't speak vociferously and proudly about something you don't know. It shows your ignorance. Don't do that. If you're not sure, say, I'm not sure. And say, I think. Say, I, I, I've heard. Uh, but don't speak about it with certainty if you don't know. It makes you sound dumb. Uh, and instead, it's much wiser to keep your mouth, you know, more more silence than than talking, and especially about opinion formulation, which we're very uh, uh, kind of we live in a society which which allows a lot for that. Let's keep it a little bit, you know, and especially about governance and stuff like that. Until you really see how it operates and understand it, don't let the news media, you know, uh, uh, force feed, you feed you right. a worldview. Right. There's so, another thing here, which is this is one of the keystones to strengthening one's relationships. Be it to their children, to their spouses, to their friends, or even to themselves, is make promises and keep them. Right. That's right. If you make promises and keep them, your relationship will always have a sound basis. I'll give you another example, which is advice or, or, uh, or uh, recommendations. If somebody asks me about a person, I'm going to be as honest as possible about that. I am never going to... I'm, if, if I recommend people know that I'm going to recommend, that means that I really... Am, am invested in this recommendation and if I don't I'm just gonna say I don't know and I've made that mistake one time with somebody who asked me should what do I think about this girl that he was about to be married to and I said yeah great yeah no Gary and you know they got divorced later on and I thought to myself I'm I made it I wasn't my fault no of course not but it was but you felt like you you weren't honest in that moment I wasn't honest and, and I, it wasn't that I was dishonest I didn't put in weight gravitas to those words mm -hmm. and I should have said to him I don't know or if I had some concern, I would say, look, here I have a concern. And I want to tell you a quick story about this. And that is that uh, I was talking about a certain rabbi, a certain rabbi that I think is a very, very, very wise rabbi and a strong rabbi that I respect. 
And he is also kind of famous, and he also is opinionated, and some people don't like him. And I met, and, and I was in the town of this rabbi, and I met somebody, and I was talking to her, and I said to her, you know, I do like this rabbi of your town. And she said to me, well, I want to tell you a story about him. One time, uh, when I was getting married, my husband-to-be, we were about to sign a prenup, and we were just about to get married, and the husband returned the prenup marked out with red highlighter, red, red marks, and crossed out things and little all kinds of stuff like that in changes that he made because he was a lawyer. I brought it to the rabbi, and this was like three days before the wedding. The rabbi said, look, call off the wedding. That's my advice to you. Don't marry this guy. And this girl was like, rabbi, are you nuts? You know? I can't do that. It's three right, days for the wedding. Yeah. And also, what kind of rabbi are you? You know, I love this guy. We love each other. You know, this, the rabbi's like, look, I'm telling you my opinion. Call off the wedding. And you could guess that she did not listen to him. And then later was embroiled in a horrific, awful divorce that took a very long time. Okay, with this person. So, so to me is that this, this uh, how did we get to this? The advice you give, give it weight. Right, like, like he... He went for it. He went for it. He went for his truth. And, that's, and, I, and I was like, wow, that's even more respect than I even knew about this rabbi. But it wasn't easy to say that, but his words were invested with truth. And he didn't just... Okay. Ooh, right. uh, that's right. Time, Lime is timid, and we got to keep going. How, how long do we have? Do we have five more minutes or what? Okay. Uh, it, it, right. I was just about to say there's a verse here, uh, verse, uh, chapter 25, verse 4. Lo tachsom shor v'disho. Do not muzzle a, a ox... ox when it's amongst the threshing, threshing, the threshing, and we use this very commonly in Israel, which is like, like if you're about to make kiddush on Shabbos, don't wait too long because all the kids are waiting, everybody's <laughs> yes. waiting. And we Bad use this, idea, right? And and this also means like don't don't hold back a person in his in his natural in his natural place. Like be 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 conscious of where the other person is. Mm -hmm. And maybe this also has something to do with a big question that we don't have time for right now, which is dressing modestly. Mm. And 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 how and this is a big question that I actually am thinking about a lot, which is how much do I have to be concerned with what's in your head? Like how yeah. much do I have to be concerned with your that is a big question. with your proclivities? Yeah, it's a big question. If they're, if they're natural proclivities, I would say just because you brought it up, I think that the the tide has turned on that in our time. Mm -hmm. Is that that the only real. Uh, justification for modesty is as an intrinsic value and not in terms of what happens to other people when they're in immodest environments because the reality is that that we know enough now about human psychology and behavior that a person needs to claim ownership of their own their own inner life and their own actions that being said i think modesty has its own intrinsic value whether it's modesty for the way a man acts whether it's with modesty for the way a woman acts but i am actually not so fond of uh, of the this impetus toward modesty be being in a concern of how others will respond to me mm -hmm. i mean you I, seen I, me in shorts on the, on the one hand I, I i hear you but on the other hand uh there are certain human human uh, it bothers me when you see actresses Right, who are who are much certain actresses, obviously, or certain models who are part of their whole life thing is to attract, yes, and then also coming down very hard at being, you know, objectified. Uh, objectified. It's like, wait a minute, come on, you you were you were using that very very uh, that that very proclivity. You're but using that's a that. different discourse because that's the so desire it's, to to have your cake and eat it too. Uh, what I'm speaking about is the very common way in which modesty is used to try to project the inner struggles of a man onto the way that a woman dresses. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about on the streets. What you're speaking about is people who have created an industry of lust. Let's just call right. it what it is. Okay, right. you can't create an industry of lust and then sort of like deny your responsibility for what happens to people when they react to you. That I get. The problem with that is that, um, is that I think that men have not worked hard enough to just own their own behavior on that front. Let's call it what it is. It's true. It's true. And I, I agree with you. And I think there's a tension there. At the same time, we do have some kind of lizard brain that, that has, that has the, that's the modern terminology for yeah, this, sure. that, has, that, has, uh, that, that, that has natural reactions. And, and there is a subtle interest in evoking those, not subtle, a very not subtle interest in evoking those reactions. Yeah, for sure. Um, and that is part of the, I mean, it's, that's what I mean by cake. That's what you said, cake. Yeah, it's part of the too. human condition. Right. But, like, but if you're going to play on that, know that, that that's what you're playing on. That's, yes, yes. And our society is actually flooding us. 
and and we talked yeah. about it a little bit last week. The uh, pornographic nature of our society. Right. That's right. For sure. Right. And then so so you're asking for two things at the same time. Yeah. Withstand mass amount of uh, supernormal normal stimuli. You're basically incitement. Right. Incitement. If that's fair to talk about it that way. And then at the same time, you you want to ask for super. Uh, proper behavior oh, and, it's, and it's definitely fair to talk about it that way not necessarily in the part of this individual or that individual but there are industries whose purpose is to incite particularly men but also women on different things and and, and then one of the problems is that plays itself out in interpersonal relationships right. in very ugly ways okay this is a big topic we're not going to get through all of it Sorry, let's just couldn't, couldn't resist no it. it's very important but uh, very very important and, I, and I, we, maybe we should take some time to talk about it let's finish off with the last thing i'm even skipping an important one but Let's go to the last verse that I want to discuss today, last group of verses, which is about Amalek. Uh, remember what Amalek did to you. Uh, this is at the end of the Torah portion, uh, Deuteronomy 25, uh, chapter 25, verse 17. Remember what Amalek did to you when you came out of Egypt. He, uh, it happened to you on the way or he cooled you off on the, on the way. He struck at you and, and your rear, all the people that were fallen behind and you were tired and you didn't have uh, faith in God. And it will be when Hashem will, will let you defeat all of your enemies around in the land which Hashem, your God, gives to you. Remember to uh, erase the memory of Amalek from under the heavens. You shall not forget. This is the famous Zachor. We read this right before Purim every year. This is the famous chapter of, of Remember This. It's one of the six remembrances in the Torah that asks you to remember something. Amalek strikes at you. It's the anti-Israel. It's the, it's the, it's the doubt of mankind it's the cooling off of, of a belief in god of, of heat uh of excitement in the service of god and it also strikes at the at the folks who are the weakest at the maybe the disbelievers the unbelievers maybe the people who are who have somehow fallen out of the camp just disadvantaged as well i mean uh, I, i'm i i've always related to this in our time as a sort of an inner struggle and an inner conceptual battle but you know in my last episode on the reparations um, I encountered some of the writings of Rav Soloveitchik, who said the, he believed that Amalek always has a physical manifestation in the world as another people, right? And he specifically was applying it to the Germans, and, and he was opposed to taking any reparations money from Germany. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's, it's just, I think, very important to, to note that, that all these um, elements of the anti-Israel and the, the, those who strike on the weak, etc., like, what everyone thinks metaphysically it's not hard to trace the fact that they seem to manifest themselves within socio-political realities as well. And it raises a very difficult and important question for us as a people is what's our responsibility in the face of manifest political and cultural evil, right? C can we just draw, circle the wagons and say we're okay? That's what I understand here is once you can do that in your land, now you have a different level of responsibility, which is to fight evil in the world as a whole. Mm -hmm. It's not enough just to be safe and a normal people in your land. That's and, not your and, job. And yet we have... Nazi-like ideology in our land. Uh, so there, we're not even safe within our land. Right. Even even in in the streets of Jerusalem, there are no-go zones uh, of places that have deep Nazi ideology that sure. that, uh, that, that that the Israeli police, Israeli army, can't get control of. And one of the things I would point out is that they also parallels those places within us, where we let the weak and and the disadvantaged just fall behind. Mm -hmm. Right. Where we we don't have this level of commitment, not even to one another, much less the people who lie outside of our immediate camp. Um, and so I see the two as coming together. But there's a there's a parallel process of fighting that battle of evil in the world. I just want to finish off the show by saying I think that there was a great moment of reckoning when I saw Prime Minister Netanyahu climb out of a German sub slash U boat. Okay, when when we bought when Israel bought I think six uh, 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 German submarines to protect our oil fields in the Mediterranean here. Uh, and and Prime Minister Netanyahu kind of climbed out of one of these ships. And if you know anything about the the submarines, that was one of the greatest German weapons. They were always the best at it. They were yeah, always sure. great makers of submarines. They have tremendous experience in it. World War One, not to mention World War Two, but there were a lot. And even already in World War One, they had these U-boats. And so I just want to say, when I saw that, I thought to myself, you know, uh, it was the question Closing of a circle. Yeah, it was it, it was a great irony. It was a great irony when German subs are in the service of, of the state of Israel. There was something something ironic and, and amazing about that. In any case, Rabbi Mike Foyer, I want to thank you so much uh, for covering with me uh, the Torah portion of Kitetze. A lot, a lot of Torah here. A lot to learn, both Mamish. morally and legally. Uh, and it's a living Torah. It's a living Torah, and behind it is a ton of. Uh, uh, oral Torah, 
the 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 Talmud, the Mishnah, it, and, and the law. It's it's these are all just chapter headings. And uh, thanks so much for for touching them with me. Always a pleasure. Shabbat shalom. God bless you, everybody. Stay tuned. Malka Fleischer is, of course, next. We thank Rabbi Mike Foyer. By the way, people can reach you at uh, Rav Mike at thelandofisrael.com and also your website, which is jewishstory.co. That's C-O. Uh, and also... On Facebook, Rav Mike Foyer. That's right. And your other show, The Jewish Story, here at the network. And, of course, uh, my stuff. You know, Yishai Fleischer. It's easy to find me. And there you go. More great stuff is on the way. Stay tuned. Stay strong. Stay connected. And we'll be right back. Prime Minister Netanyahu. Benny Gantz. Avidor Lieberman. Yeah, Lapid. Betzalus Smantrich. Moshe Feiglin. What's going on behind the scenes? As Israelis prepare to go to the polls on September 17th, tune in to Inside Israel Today on the Land of Israel Network on thelandofisrael.com for all the action as it happens. Shalom, everybody, and welcome back to the Yishai Fleischer Show. This uh, part of the show, broadcasting from Judea, and you are still part of the show wherever you are. And we moved a little bit south towards uh, Judea and Gush Etzion, uh, and I'm joined by my beloved Malka Fleischer. Malka, shalom. Shalom. Nice to be back. Nice to have you. For another nice week. Here we are in the month of Elul, before the holiday of Rosh Hashanah. You know, you know how I know it's winter, by the way, that winter's coming, Yishai? There's yeah. one sign in Israel. Okay. And if you're perceptive, you can tell exactly when the winter season starts. Mm-hmm. And that is when the Krembo comes out in the grocery store. Mm-hmm. There's a tasty treat. It's called Krembo. It's a little biscuit. There's like a fluffy marshmallow top and then some chocolate on top of that. And it only comes out in the wintertime because it's melty. In the summertime, no crembo. You cannot find it anywhere. And I've seen it, Isha. I've cited the crembos in the grocery store, which mm-hmm. means that the, that the seasons are changing. I appreciate the crembo, but I find it to be too delicate. Too delicate, too given to being smushed. And also the, the white fudginess inside. Fluffiness, uh, really? Fluffiness, yeah, yeah. Uh, is, is too... It's too plasticky a little bit for mm. me. It's a little. It's not my. I understand. It it's too do it. like factory marshmallow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I, I do, I do, I do recognize the greatness. Yeah. Uh, of There's the, even crembo ice cream flavor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Also, I'm, I'm getting to a point where what, things you've grown that, up. Well, things that taste too sweet are bothersome to me. I don't like too sweet. It's just like. Well, Yishai, you know, it's interesting that you say that because I've looked through your genetic information. And it turns out that you are more inclined to like salty things, statistically, whereas I am more inclined to like sweet things, statistically. I don't know if you know that. I didn't know that, but but that's but that's for example, it's, that's not seems to be a little challenged by the fact that, for example, uh, when it comes to blinches, blinces, yeah. I prefer them sweet. You like them savory. Same mm. with 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 Pesach products like like what do you call it, matzah brai. Mm-hmm. Where I like to call matzah bride. <laughs> that's that's when you're like married to somebody who's going to make you matzah, <laughs> matzah bride. Bai. You know, so matzah bride is, is what I prefer. Uh, and also you're born close to Passover, so I think of you as my matzah bride. Uh. Um, <laughs> and I like it, again, sweet. You like it savory. That's true. And and my genetic information revealed to you that I Yeah, I don't know if you know that I've looked through your genetic information. You told me, actually, that I was allowed to look through your gen- your genetic information so it's not like I just went through genetic information. No, I, I gave you permission because I couldn't figure it out anyway. Because I made a decision. And the decision was that we were going to take one of those 23andMe DNA tests mm-hmm. to find out all kinds of stuff about ourselves. Right. Really, it was because it was Prime Day on Amazon and I bought those kits 50% off. So usually they're $100 and I bought them for $50 so each of us could have a kit. And I've been saving this kit. For a long time, I made you schlep it back from one of your trips to America. Yeah. And I made you schlep it back in your in your luggage. And it's been sitting on a shelf for a long time. And I'm a little bit, how do you say, neurotic, right? And so I was like grappling with this idea. Do I want to take a DNA test? Do I not want to take a DNA Where test? Where does the neurosis show up mean? in this? 
And then and then ultimately I what, looked at the boxes the and neurosis? I saw that the what? What's what neurosis is well, associated? Well, the neurosis with is that well, there's a few neuroses. One neurosi. is like neurosi. Yeah. One is like an old school Eastern European fear that someone's going to have my medical information. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. Maybe that's an American fear. I'm not sure which kind of fear that is. I'm just afraid there's going to be more like me. People will be like, now we can clone you. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. No, I never worry that someone wants to clone me. I more think like, oh, now they know too much about me. Oh. So that's number one. Number two. Okay. This is sensitive. So here we go. Safe I don't want to be. I don't want to be. I don't want to be disparaging of anyone. Okay. This is safe space. But All of our listeners are in safe space. My whole life growing mode. up, the more like Jewishy side of my family was always my father's side. They're Holocaust survivors. They would tell me stories about their religious parents, and I just always like felt the Jewishiness from my father's side. On my mother's side, I knew everyone was Jewish, right? And because I like being Jewish and want to be Jewish, and I like that I, I was born Jewish as well. So I, like on my mother's side, so they're Jewish, right? And everyone had a Hebrew name and everything like that, but they were very like modern American, not so like mitzvah keeping Jews. And I think inside my head, I always had this fear that, like, what if I'm not actually Jewish? It's like, I don't know. Does anyone else have that out there? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? The, like, the secret fear that, like, maybe I'm not actually Jewish. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm non-Jewish. And then, not that that's, I mean, you know, that's cool, too. But, like, I've been raised my whole life believing that I'm Jewish. And I like to be Jewish. And I want to be Jewish. And this was specifically on your mother's side. On my mother's side was like the teensy little question mark that I never told anybody that I had mm -hmm. in my in my little heart. So then the DNA tests are sitting on the thing. And I'm like, okay, we just... The, it's expiring, right? So then the other Jewish part of my neurosis kicked in. And I was like, well, this is going to expire. I'm going to waste my money. That's not that's not what we do, right? We, we use the thing before it expires. Mm -hmm. So we finally went on a trip to America on our, on our last trip. And on our last, like hour and our last trip to america i was like okay you should get some spit together and we spit into these things and we marked them down and we registered them online and for, we sent them in the mail first thing we had to do a very unjewish thing is we didn't we had to not eat for not 30 eat for minutes. 30 minutes which was right. a long time that's right it was the longest 30 minutes of my life anyway so and we were in brooklyn at the time also to <laughs> add a to place that. of plenty of good yeah, jewish lots food. of jewish ice cream and stuff yeah. anyway so then we spit into the thing and we sent it off and then i didn't really think of it again until you started getting email like we're we're parsing your genotype or I don't know what it, what kind of things they tell you in the email. And then I was like, oh, man, they're like working on my DNA right now. And then. Finally, you got the big notification, Ishai. Right. They had mapped my genome. They figured out my 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 genome -itude. I was fully, uh, fully genome compatible. I, they, they got it. They got yeah, me. Yeah, they had you locked down. They knew down. my stuff. They knew my stuff. They knew my, my, my toe hairs. They knew everything about so me. So I was a little nervous, right? Because, you know, you're finding out a lot about yourself right there. And we opened the link to the 23andMe, Yishai uh, at the 23andMe website. Right, just to make sure everybody understands, we're, we're talking about mapping your, your, your genome. Right. And they Not, also tell you... Is that the right way to say it? Or mapping your genes? Uh, genes. They, um, it, it's like useful in a few ways. One is that the more people who participate in this kind of thing, the more they can like link people together and determine who is a relative. Also, um, they can tell you things about your health. For example, if you're a carrier for one of like uh, several you know, genetic diseases or what you're like, if you have an increased risk of, of different things, uh, later in life or now in life or whatever, whether you need to kind of like think about doing something for your health. Um, and it tells you what your matrilineal line is. And if you're a boy and you have a Y chromosome, then it also tells you about your patrilineal line and tells you like information about where you're from. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, we took this test pretty much feeling relatively confident that we knew where we're from. I mean, for the last hundreds of years anyway. Um, but still, you know, there's that uncertainty. We, we talked to some friends. Hundreds of years? I or I feel like a couple hundred years, maybe. Not even. I don't feel, I don't know. Or 150 where my, years. Yeah, I know where my like great grandparents are from, but, but you know, 
yeah, but right. but it's not like right. It's not solid. It's not solid, and they don't tell you on that level. It's not like they right. give you the chart. I wish that it gave you like a family tree. But that that's a different that you could do that. So that's, we got to do that. That's we Jewish that Gen. Too. That's so I went to Jewish Den. I went to Jewish Gen today. I couldn't understand. Like it's not a genetic thing. It no, like. it's a it's not. It's like where you write down who your parents were, right. and then but other people write, a, write down who their parents were. And but if you, you write kinda... enough names, it starts to link you in ah. to to a whole uh, ancestry. That's cool. Uh, yeah, it's not it's not it's not a genetic thing at all. I see. It's like a fam It's like a group. It's like a family crowdsourced tree. family tree. Yeah, crowds crowdsourced family. That's tree. cool. Anyway, so, so okay, so we opened your page, Ishai. They open my page. And to see and, what you are exactly. Right. And I'm we like talked thinking, to some friends earlier in the day who were like, yeah, we're, it said that we're like a high percentage Jewish and then like 1% Viking. And well, we're like, okay. Right. Uh, and I was like, like, uh, you know, and you know, my family comes from, from Russia and Poland. And I was thinking, I don't know, you know, maybe I have a Tatar or, <laughs> or some kind of, you know, <laughs> some, you know something, some other you know gene that 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 snuck in there. I mean, your S nose is relatively small. Yeah, yeah, and and I and I and now this is again, God forbid, not to disparage anybody, but we have a we have a we have a blessing that we say, thank you, God, that you did not make me one of the Gentiles. Okay, because it is a privilege to be a Jew, and it is a privilege to be a Gentile and a human being for sure. Yeah, but we like our job. We, we like our job. Our we job. appreciate our job, and it's 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 an honor. Just to be nominated, so so I was, uh, I was a little bit like it could be I could be anything. Now my disposition is such that it wasn't going to really bother me. I might have even taken a bit of pride if I had a little bit of Viking in me, <laughs> and then would have like researched Viking history or something like that. But it turned out that I was ninety nine point nine Ashkenazi Jewry. <laughs> Mazalto. And we were like, whoa, that is very Jewish. Right. And I was, you know, and I'm like, wow. And, and, and so it's 99.9%, uh, you know, like, like that, that's what you are. You're a Jew, dude. You're a Jew. And I felt so good about myself. Uh, and I was just like, you now, started gloating. I wasn't really gloating via vis-a-vis -vis myself, because for me, I'm telling you, if you would have told me that I'm 80% Jewish, I'd have been like, okay, great. You know what I mean? And I would have been actually proud of my Irish, Scottish celtic heritage okay or something like that <laughs> but um, nay but nay nay i'm not a highlander yeah sorry so although You're a dead I, sea diver you shy right although i thought that the scotch that i drank uh this last this last uh i'm not a big scotch guy but i did drink scotch this this last shabbat uh it, didn't, I guess it didn't influence, it didn't influence, the it didn't influence the genetics and it truthfully i don't scotch doesn't work on me and that's another proof. little manischewitz feel yeah. much better okay so in any case i was 99 now i wasn't gloating vis-a-vis -vis myself but it was funny to me that you got this face on that you were like, oh, my God, they're going to discover that there is something wrong with my side, as you mentioned right. before. And so then I was feeling like a bar <laughs> of ivory soap. I was 99.44% 99 pure, you know. Wow. And, and it made me laugh a little bit. And I felt... Yeah, that and I, then I had not gotten my results also. I felt that I'd one-upped you and as, as being a person who's married... We all know, right? You got to leverage what you can. That that is a pleasure. <laughs> so so I was enjoying that, that that feeling that I was better than you. Okay, right. and I while. got then I got nervous. A and total I thought and I thought to fear. myself and I thought to myself, there's no way she's gonna beat me now. The best she could hope for is to like match, match it nine nine point nine. And she's not gonna match it. Cause, there's no way, and that's what I also felt. Right. I also felt that there is no way. And they had delayed that I match, and they delayed, and I'm like, that's it. And you, they no, delayed because my DNA is so complex, full of random stuff, right. that it's like they have to sit down with their with their calculators and work it all out. <laughs> Moreover, probably I'm a carrier for like a hundred billion things, and then they have to write all that down. I, I, I did and then uh, I did suspect you of being more of a genetic mutt that's carrying. Disgusting. Stuff. You at two, Ishai. <laughs> you know, you admit it. You thought to yourself. Then I started a little bit refreshing the twenty three and Me page without telling you because I was like, "When are my results coming in? When are my results coming in? When am I?" And I started to get nervous, and then it told me that my, my results are like nine more days away. I was like, "I can't wait nine days. I'm not going to sleep." Anyway, today in the morning, 
I refreshed it one more time and there it was. My results were in. And I was like, oh my God, I said a little prayer. I definitely had like one or two heart palpitations. <laughs> and then I opened to Ishai. Yeah. And I was like, Ishai, whatever's going to happen, Ishai's just going to rub it in for the rest of my life that he's 99.9% .9 Ashkenazi Jewish. So I opened my results. And I am 100% Ashkenazi Jewish. Oh my God. I couldn't believe that. That is 100.0%. So you had your 0.1% is fine, Ishai. They couldn't identify it. It was some kind of like gruel of humanity Dude. that got, you know, Dude, maybe it's Neanderthal. There's a word for it. It's called alloy. Okay. <laughs> You don't want to wear just to strengthen it. You don't want to wear twenty four k. No, you, know, you want to wear fourteen k. It's like it's like a nice shirt that has like one percent spandex. Yeah, it okay? gives it a little stretch. That's right. I have no stretch in my genetics. <laughs> Interestingly, by the way, you're not a carrier for like anything. Congratulations. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if we need to share this with people. <laughs> but I like you had, and you're not like at no increased risk for anything bad. I like had a little bit of like scruffiness in my. <laughs> health report because you're 100 percent not so terrible not got, terrible because you got no Baruch stress Hashem. You got Baruch no stress. Hashem, yeah it's just like a lot of inbreeding <laughs> so then you get stuff oh but yeah God. it was it was exciting and then wait so here was the here was the uh the last bit but then i was like here's me right i'm like 100 percent, but that can't be like all the, like 100 percent is 100 mm -hmm. and then there's this like way to manipulate the thing so you can like at like make it worse or something you can like say uh -huh. like less certainty or whatever and i and then it was like like if you do it to maximum uncertainty level which i didn't all the way understand but if you do it to maximum uncertainty level then um then i got to like 98.2 percent and all then right. i was like that's it that's the 1.8 the 1.8 that's definitely the not jewish part yeah. but then but then they group you into your your haplotypes, haplo groups, haplo groups. So, like I said, the the Y what, what chromosome, it's like where you're like the maternal haplo group is like where your mother's 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 mother infinity is from, and your paternal not haplo in, not infinity not infinity until whenever uh, uh, chava right until right. Eve, then the male. Uh, the Y chromosome, which I obviously don't have, so couldn't check, uh, goes back to your father's 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 hundreds of generations back. My father's father. Yeah, too. father's father's father. Yeah. If you can tell me, by the way, where that is from, I will yeah. send you some big prize. If you can tell me where my father's father's father is from, I'm giving you no more clues that I send you something huge. There is one okay? clue. I'll give one clue. Which no. Is, it's related to what Ishai and Malka think and do. Yes. It, okay. It's, fine. It's within our. It's within our realm. It's right. within the realm. It's not outside the realm. Right, okay. That's go. it. That's it. Okay. Good, good one, Malka. Yeah. Then, uh, I don't think anyone's gonna get it, but we'll see. Okay. So then I checked my maternal haplogroup. Okay? okay. Where are this is it? Like, where does my mother's mother's mother come from? Because this is like the big question mark. I want to know. And I find it's I can't remember what it's called. K one N nine. I don't remember what it is. So some like some haplogroup. And I clicked on that. They're like, this haplogroup is really, really Jewish. They're like, learn about etrogs and this Yiddish word and all this stuff. They're like trying to teach me about my heritage. And it turns out that my mother's 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 mother comes from like a very like well-known, <laughs> like it has yichas. It has like a, it's a well-known Jewish woman haplogroup. And I was like, thank you, Lord. Because the Lord knows that I'm neurotic, okay? And then I would that, never way, give myself any group. peace. Right. I, interestingly, I told my sister, I'm like, I got this DNA test. And it's uh, like, I told her a little bit about it, that we have the, the this haplogroup group and everything. She's like, that's where my anxiety and craziness comes from, isn't it? I'm like, yes, it is. That's where, where it comes. Where? She said the same thing. You're like, that's where the neurosis comes from, from the maternal haplogroup. group. Yeah. My sister said the same exact thing. Yeah. So... So, uh, so yeah, it turns out that my mother's 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 mother is Jewish. So congratulate me, everybody. And I can just, I can sleep now. I can go to sleep tonight. I don't want to hurt any of our Gentile listeners' feelings. No, I definitely don't. No, but it's just 
that. it's just that it, this is a thing that as Jewish people, you're, you know, you, you become uh, We're a tribe. Yeah. We're a tribe. And it's And really... the Judaism goes down by the mother. Yeah. And uh, for was... other people, you know, I asked a friend of ours who was over for Shabbat recently. I'm like, well, what about people who are not from, you know, one of these Jewish haplogrips? And they're like, yeah, those are our righteous converts. And I'm like, yeah, that's really cool. Mm hmm. Our converts are, are one of the are one of the most beautiful part of our mm -hmm. of our family. Wait a minute, well, and was my haplo group cool or what? So I looked at your haplo group. The word Jewish did not appear in your description of your haplo group. But then I did a little research online for you, and it turns out, Ishai, that your maternal haplo group is from. There's like two groups of people of Jews who who like kind of have more people from this haplo group. One is Iranian Jews, and one is Bulgarian Jews. Bulgaria, incidentally, not so far. It's like an Eastern European country, so sure. that's where maybe it originated from. Was from a little bit outside the. I mean, your your Bulgaria, mother's parts of Bulgaria. Basically, are parts your mother of Rome. told me that your like the history the history of the the women in the family is very very long in Russia and that whole area. So. Just so, so you know, the Bulgaria, Bulgaria, down, Bulgaria down was Bulgaria. originally well, it was a Roman colony. It was a Roman colony originally, hmm. uh, and they still have some. Maybe of you're the, Iranian, Ishai. Iranian? I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, that'd be I, cool. I don't know. I, I'm sure. Or maybe you're Bulgarian. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, if you folks out there have a little bit more clue about this 23andMe or the other ones, for example, my mom said to me that Heritage. She she read that Heritage is a better, uh, a more kind of thorough. Uh, G genetic uh, uh, understanding of things or if you've been involved in and uh, see my my friends um i have i have a few people who got really involved in jewish gen oh. and really found documents wow. of their of their That's incredible you know, uh, the great grandparents coming on ellis island and all kinds of wow. ship, ship manifests and all kinds of stuff wow. like that. really cool stuff and it's all online today people really do some research they get really really into it and they find where they're from well, our friends, our Jewish friends who found out that they're part Viking, they like couldn't be happier. They're so excited that they're part Viking. It's like much more fun for them now yeah. than it was when they the, thought that they were just regular European Jews. Yeah, they're reading Beowulf and everything. It's great. Yeah, they're wearing uh, those hats with the horns. One cool thing was that they were like, well, there's one family member that you definitely have. And it was my cousin. Right? Yeah, the uh, the machine found your cousin. The the uh, the website also found my cousin. I saw I like he used kind of like a he just put an initial for his last name, but since I know what his last name is, then I, I saw that my cousin has also yeah. done 20. I do want to tell you by the way that while you were gone today, you did get a kind of spam type email through the 23 and me system uh, of somebody like some kind of it, some kind of inappropriate. What? Yes. Yes. No. Yes, yes. Yes. Asking for your information. And stuff. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. It was. It, what does that mean? Let's just say it's not. In, people. In, this is family stuff. People. Yeah. Well, let me just say it's not invalu invaluable. Whatever it is. It's. It's. Uh, yeah. Wa watch out over there. All right. 23 and me is. Uh, you know, you don't want to be showing your jeans to everybody. Let's yeah, just put it that seriously, way. Seriously. Keep it saying? in your jeans. That's right. <laughs> keep your jeans in your jeans. All right. Uh, so congratulations to Malka and myself yes. and uh, congratulations to our children, I guess. Um, and congratulations to everybody because the truth is we come from a great big pool of humanity and we got, everyone's got a really interesting story. Yeah. Our story happens to be a European shtetl story. <laughs> I, I don't know. You know, uh, I kind of like, that's only for the last 2000 years, but before that we were, in our land for hundreds and hundreds of years and then before that we were in in in, in iran you know and, and those right, areas. it did say that your maternal haplogroup traveled through egypt each eye which that's right i know is true that's right that's right no it's it literally says move from yeah move through egypt right so so that's cool uh that's that's really cool and um i don't think i understand all the stuff yet I, I'd, I'd like to understand a little bit better but but it's it's definitely fun and um we're learning a lot about ourselves, about our psychologies, about about what makes up our bodies, about where we come from, about 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 our internet proclivities or whatever it is. There's like a lot of info out there about us. Yeah, um, that's why I got nervous. One of the there, reasons I got nervous about taking this test. But there is no genotype for God. I'm thinking I might, I might call the uh, the show the God's genotype or hmm, the genotype of God. You know, 
you, 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 the genotype from God, you won't know it. You won't know it. Uh, God has God's, no DNA. God's or God genome. is all the DNA. God has not made well. Yeah. Right. I'm just saying. No DNA. Well, the the only DNA that He's given us is the Torah. That's that's his D, that's his that's his genetic footprint, if you will. That's his that's his mind. That's what He has shared with us. Uh, and that's that's his that's his that's his footprint of genius in this world. And and there's also this world, which is a mirror of of what He believes in, if you will. Hmm. And uh, and that that's his that's his uh, imprint on this world, and uh, and we could follow it. And inside that is a code. Inside the Torah, there's an incredible, incredible right. code, uh, and uh, and there's codes upon codes, and it's it's an incredible document. And um, I always feel during this time of Elo that like all the other things should be set aside mm. <laughs> and like just get back to learning Torah right. and teaching Torah and, and, and just like kind of, just kind of just get through the, the draws and, and get to the focus right. of, of, uh, of understanding his genome, his genome. Um, meanwhile, back down in reality of, of the regular, the kind of lower end reality, uh, Israel is still taking, uh, rockets, still being attacked right there's there's another genome there's another uh, kind of code which is the code of anti-semitism the anti the anti-code the, the, the code of amalek which is in this week's Torah por portion the genome of amalek by the way we kind of know the genome of amalek we know where he comes from you know the through asav's line and then and then through agag king agag who's not killed and then through H haman you know he's he's uh we he we follow him down the line as well, and he's uh, and he matches our, our 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 genome out there, and he's and he's out there, and and then they came the Nazis, you know, and and they're out there, and they're trying, and then they have their theories of uh, of racial superiority and all this kind of stuff, and they're out there uh, trying to destroy the Jewish people, and uh, they're trying to destroy our line, our seat, and really the the genome of Messiah. Can I call the Can I call the show the show that the genome? The genome of of of, uh, of Messiah. You can call it whatever you want. Messiah's <laughs> genome <laughs> and Amalek's genome. It's all out there. So so that's it, Maka. I want to really uh, thank you, and I want to tell you that we shan't have a show before elections. Oh my golly! Yet yet another. Yet that another means way. the next show is gonna be. Like when they've probably already tallied everything and stuff. Yeah. Holy it'll moly! Be, it'll be on the edge of that. Yeah. We got to see the all the votes, I guess, are the genome of the election. Well, we could right. talk about genomes forever. Yeah. Well, because because in, in in many ways, it's a way of deciphering what it's all made up of. And I just had I just had a reporter said to me, uh, many polls show that Israel's for the two state solution. I go, there is a actual poll of this country that you could trust. It's called elections. Yeah. And he's like, yeah. I'm like, I heard that 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 uh, Avigdor Lieberman wants to make elections in Israel mandatory. Did you hear that? Elections or voting? Voting, voting, not elections. There's yeah, always voting. somebody that's talking about I think that. That's a horrible idea. In Australia, they have like 100 percent voting because it's criminal not to vote. But I then, think that's craziness. But then they have a different problem, which is like uh, people show up drunk and they vote for stuff that they don't want. I, I think if you don't want to use your vote, bye bye. You don't use your vote. I'll, I'll use your vote. I don't literally use your vote, but I'll use my <laughs> vote, and my vote will count, and your vote will not count. Uh, it's an interesting question, which I which I haven't thought through totally. So, so I, don't, I don't. I can't imagine making somebody making it mandatory for someone to decide who they want to be the leader of the country. You, you don't you don't know but, what kind of mindset you, somebody's you, in when they're forced into a vote. But forced in, it's not like literally it's, you go to jail or pay a fine or something okay. if you don't do it. Yeah, so if, let's say it's a small fine. It's just a you know something that that kind of is a motivator. Or let's say you would get a positive motivation. So you would get a a tax credit if you uh, if you voted or something. You know, it's like that's um, not I, the same I, as making voting I'm saying, mandatory i'm saying that there, there's there's ways to where there's what, ways you need to, to do push it. people to vote i never heard that you had to like force jews to express their opinion that's uh, like a first time that's a first time piece of voting around the world is dropped because people are uh they they are they they, they don't have a lot of faith in the system and they don't feel like it okay so. but that's also a vote yeah yeah it it's is also it, an expression it, it, of their 
democratic opinion or whatever um it's not allowed to express it's, themselves a, it's an interesting question i'd love to hear from our from our listeners about that that's an interesting question i i i don't i haven't read the the various kind of positions on that uh, i'd like to hear more about that why why how it works in different countries australia seems to seems to continue to to, to survive even though uh, they... australia has no natural predators isha it's it's not the same thing here uh, we have to make okay. a serious decisions all right it's still a country of that that that, that is a that has to make serious decisions. Still, people living on a, on a land and and uh, and have to have to live as best as possible. In any case, a very interesting question. You can really write to me and to Malka through my email, which is yisha at the land of Israel dot com. Yisha at the land of Israel dot com. And you can reach us, reach out to us through Facebook and through Twitter. Malka is still a, a Twitter queen out there, uh, given given all the bad guys a run for their money. <laughs> No wonder that that Nasrallah hasn't stuck his head out of the bunker. <laughs> There's like, a mock out there. Just not She'll tweet my head off. So so keep your head down, Nasrallah, because we're out to get you. And I want to really wish a lot of luck to the uh, state of Israel uh, in its upcoming vote. And I want to really bless the leaders of Israel uh, to have uh, to to be not just political but also leaders. And to have a, a great and deep motivation to move uh, our, our beloved nation forward. And we ask God that, that he uh, gives us great leaders so that we can fulfill his plan quicker and better, Amen. safer. Uh, and, and more like he likes. And I want to say thank you very much to both the genetically Jewish people. Those people who have converted into our people, have, have joined our people. And those people who are not. All the other of the Jewish awesome people race slash ethnicity slash tribe, but instead, right, all the beloved ones that are friends of the great story, and at the end, Hashem is the decider of who we are. That's right, and who we're supposed to be, and he and I heard I heard individually that, and collectively. What's his name on H dot com? There's Charlie uh, Harari, Charlie Harari, I think. Okay. And uh, Mal Leia made me um, our daughter made me watch a video that her teacher wanted her to watch. And Charlie Harari tells a great story about how he didn't shoot at the last minute of one game. The coach put him in, and he there was three seconds to go, and he didn't feel confident, so he passed the ball. The other guy shot and missed. Oh. And the coach said to him, you know, you cost us the game oh. because you didn't have belief in yourself. Next time, though, you should know this. I've been coaching for 30 years, and if I put you on the court in that last for those la last minute, it's because I've got faith in you. So next time, if you don't have faith in yourself, at least know that I have faith uh. in you. And he says, which is, which is, thank you, God, for giving me my soul back. Uh, with mercy, you have great faith in me. Mm. And he's like, Hashem has faith in us. Like, if you don't have faith in you, that's one thing. But know that Hashem has faith in us. I thought that was a great yeah, message. Really nice. I thought it was a great message. So whatever you are, whoever you are, wherever you are, and whatever you need, and whatever is lacking, and whatever you think your powers are, you are here because God has put you on this great earth. Speaking of that, I do want to thank the good folks at uh, the Land of Israel Network and the EshaiFleischer.com system, which is Moshe Herman. God bless you, and thank you so much for helping out the show. Uh, ben Bresky and Tabitha for rocking it and getting it out there on the net waves. To the world, I do want to thank the good people at Hebron, the Jewish community of, uh, and the Hebron Fund, which helps, which helps uh, keep that that uh, that engine going. And I really want to recommend that you come on one of our amazing Simcha Hachbound tours at HebronFund.org and come see the forefathers and mothers in Hebron. I want to s shout out to the Director General Uri Uri Karzen, and I want to uh, really thank them for the for the great opportunity of, of of working with them to help develop this beautiful beautiful ancient holy city it was also a great pleasure for me to be in yerushalayim today you're a kodesh yerushalayim looks just amazing yeah, and beautiful great. jerusalem and, uh, is doing and awesome it's, it's just ah what a what a what a what a, what a light what a light to the world what a light to the world and the rest of the world may you all have light out there wherever you are stay connected stay tuned stay part of the story stay tuned in to god who's broadcasting 24 7 stay powerful stay tactical uh don't go changing and, and lots of smiles out there because we have a great gift. Maka Flesh, I want to thank you so much for being with me again. Thanks, Ishai. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Good news to you all. Shabbat Shalom.
Israel this past week hosted the 2019 Flag Football European Championship. Josh Haston here, host of Israel Uncensored on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. Check out my show this week, an interview with Steve Leibowitz, president of American Football in Israel. Get all the details on this major tournament, first time ever, hosted in the city of Jerusalem.